Is every moment of your life lived simply to glorify God the Father? Simply to glorify God the Son, Jesus Christ? Simply to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest His perfect will and work in the lives of others around you? Because that's the life that Christ has called us to. And the characteristic of that life is suffering. It is denying yourself at all times. Looking unto Jesus who denied himself for you and living a life that pleases him, obeys him, and reaches others for him. He goes on as we finish up this section. It says, in watchings, in fastings, the Bible says, when ye fast, not if ye fast, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love and faith, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And it goes on in verse 10, it says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. When you live a life of suffering, there will be a burden of sorrow for the world around you sinking into hell by their sins. But the Bible says in Psalm 1611, in the Lord's presence, there is fullness of joy. When you're obeying the Lord, no matter what you experience, there will be a joy unspeakable and full of glory that will engulf you because you are doing what pleases him. Amen. So the first characteristic is suffering. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of John. John chapter 7. Look at two elements of this, and then we'll move on. Discussing the characteristic content and consequences of biblical evangelism. John chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 6. We'll read to verse 7. Scripture reads, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Number one, we see Christ was hated by the world. Today, there is a picture of Jesus that everyone loved Jesus. But the Bible says in Matthew 27, when he was crucified, the Pharisees and the scribes were crucified, and they were mocking him. They were not happy with him or pleased with him at that time. And if we go to John 17, turn me to John, John 15 right now, actually. See, Christ said the world hated him because he testified that its deeds were evil. Now, Christ goes on in John 15, verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Let's go to verse 22 now. Scripture says, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. And th but this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Christ says the world hated him because by the words he spoke and by the works he did, their sin was uncovered. And Christ was one that he uncovered people's sin by preaching against it. He told people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and he calls us to do the same thing. Now when you preach righteousness, when you preach repent and believe the gospel, when you preach repent and bring forth words meet for repentance, people will not initially be happy about it. People will not initially want to give up their sin and surrender all to Jesus. But the Bible declares in the book of John chapter 8 verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's only when we yield to the Holy Spirit to speak the truth in love to people that they can know the state of their sin, that it will send them to hell unless they repent, believe in Jesus who died his bread and raised, and obey him and have salvation. Amen. We have a moral obligation, a biblical duty, not to care about what people think about us, but to care about what Christ thinks about us. Yes. The Bible declares in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. So we have to know, number one, the first element of the biblical characteristic of evangelism is suffering. And the first element there is the world will 
hate you because it hated Christ, the apostles, and the prophets. But the issue is whether the world hates us or not is not what we must look at. The issue is we must please Jesus at all costs. Consider, if you are on the street and a car is about to hit someone, about to run your neighbor over, and they are unaware of it, will it be love to just sit back and let the car hit them? Will it be love to say, hi, I love you, you're my friend, here I have a cookie for you, and the car hits them and destroys them? No, it wouldn't be love. You might have to say, stop, turn. They might get mad at you, but if they obey you and get out of the way, they'll be very thankful that you have been a vessel to save their life. How much more eternally will we have friends and family, neighbors, strangers, the citizens here in Long Island, those in India who are on the highway of sin about to be run over to hell by Satan, how much more should we warn them to turn, submit to Christ before they perish? A biblical mandate and obligation. So see, number one, the first characteristic is suffering. There's a suffering in the flesh to cease from sin. There's a suffering to the opinions of your fellow man. And there also is a suffering to preach the gospel no matter, even if you're misunderstood and hated by the world, you're yielding to Jesus to see saved. We have to obey Christ and do his work. The second characteristic. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, please. First characteristic is suffering. The world hated and persecuted the apostles in Christ. The Bible says the world will hate you. But when they repent, believe in Christ, and are saved, they'll be very thankful to you for yielding to Jesus and preaching the gospel to them. The second characteristic, Ezekiel chapter 3, we'll start in verse 17. Good to read, son of man. I have made thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. The first characteristic of biblical evangelism is suffering. Secondly, the content of biblical evangelism is warning. Warning. In this we see the Holy Spirit through the prophet Ezekiel giving two types of warning. Ezekiel was told by God that he must warn the wicked, warn those who were rejecting God and living lives of sin. But then Ezekiel was also told he must warn the righteous that they do not go back into sin. Personally, I've experienced the necessity and importance of this in evangelism. Years ago, when I was a staff evangelist at a church, and was training people in evangelism, at first we saw, in approximately four years, 14,000 people make decisions for Christ. That was a blessing. But over time, I noticed that a very small percentage of those decisions became actual disciples of Jesus. I found that the Bible said there were certain elements that had been extracted and subtracted from modern evangelism, which were causing the church to be filled with false converts. Now, when the Bible declares, when the spirit of truth has come, in John chapter 16, verse 11, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on Christ. Of righteousness because Christ goes to the Father, they see him no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. But now the Bible went on to say, in the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 20, By the law is the knowledge of sin. Psalm 19.7 said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And Galatians 3.24 says, The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 